And what happens if the Avengers return? You don't think I thought about that? Maybe we should call our friends. No, 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 we can't jump the gun on that. We get them in a fight with the Skrulls. They find themselves duplicated and turned into terrorists. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Secret Invasion Episode 2 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships, too. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and post your favorite Easter egg from the episode. Everybody's probably going to be freaking out about Super Scrolls because it's a huge Fantastic Four Easter egg, and it confirms one of my big theories, so we'll talk about that during the video. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet, we'll start at the beginning and just work our way through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Starting with the episode title, Promises, a reference to Nick Fury and Captain Marvel's promise to find the Skrulls a home and their failure to live up to that promise, like a broken promise. It's the whole reason why Gravik radicalized some of the Skrulls and orchestrated this whole secret invasion plot. They explained the Skrulls' side of the promise is that they were going to use their shape-shifting abilities to work for Nick Fury as undercover agents going on missions like him, like they were super S.H.I.E.L.D. agents when S.H.I.E.L.D. was still around. The episode starts with a quick flashback montage to 1995 and the events of the Captain Marvel movie, just sort of like a quick recap of how he met the Skrulls in the first place and what happened to the Skrulls during that movie. There was a lot of backstory for the scrolls in the episode and a lot of references to stuff that's happening in other parts of the galaxy too, which I'll reference because I think that's connections to what's happening in future Marvel movies like the Marvels movie. During those events, Talos said that there were thousands of them that had been separated and the ones on Earth in the first movie were just the beginning, like a very small prelude to what we're now seeing in Secret Invasion. Then it jumps to 1997 in Brixton, London. Nick Fury has been wearing his trademark eye patch for a while. If you remember in the Captain Marvel post credit scene, Coulson had brought him a bunch of fake eyes and he was trying to figure out what to do about his eye. This is meant to be the eye patch that he just continued to wear through the 2000s. Nick Fury meets Gravik for the first time when he was younger and learns about his backstory. Gravik's parents were one of the many different families that were killed during the Kree Skrull War. Vara thinks that he should bring him onto his special forces because of his skills. And if you couldn't tell, Vara is also meant to be the same woman in the WandaVision post credit scene who came to recruit Monica Rambeau in present day for Nick Fury's Saber space station, who we see in the Marvel's trailer at the beginning. I was sent by an old friend of your mother's. He'd like to meet with you. Where? Right now, when this is going on, that's already happened, so she's currently in outer space working on that Saber space station. Talos claims that they weren't able to find a home after they went looking for the past two years. Everywhere in the galaxy either didn't want them there or they were Kree controlled or Kree sympathetic planets. So it's just meant to explain their failure to find a planet for their people in that time. We also see a very young Gaia. This is Amelia Clark's character when she was young in Talos's wife. And at this time, he says there are still many thousands of families of scrolls scattered across the galaxy. Like not all of them have come to planet Earth yet. This is meant to set up the reveal later where Nick Fury's like, wait a minute, you're telling me there are millions of scrolls that have been living on planet Earth since the snap? But the whole idea is that this intro, this speech that he gives in this rousing call to action, it's meant to be very Avenger style. Like when he showed up in the Iron Man post credit scene to give Iron Man the speech about the Avengers. I'm here to tell you about something. Only in this case, it's meant to be tragic because the whole idea in present day is that it's a broken promise and that's what's led them to start Secret Invasion. They cut from young Gravik's face to him in present day immediately after the bombing. They just sort of pick up where things left off in last week's episode. And you also notice in present day, Gravik seems very suspicious of Gaia. Like he doesn't seem totally friendly to her. And later in the episode too, it's like he's kind of watching her. So I think he kind of expects her to turn on him because she is Talos's daughter. Talos is able to rescue Nick Fury in the chaos by pretending he's a Russian police officer after arresting him, and they still want you to think that Maria Hill is dead. Kobe Smulders, after last week's episode, also came out and said that she is supposed to be dead. Now, she could be trying to misdirect people, but there was an IMDb listing for her in the Marvels movie, so people thought that she was going to be in that. But then Kobe Smulders said that that was fake. She's not supposed to be in it, so that also could be more misdirection. So you can believe what you want to believe. We'll see. If you remember, during the Winter Soldier movie, Nick Fury faked his death until they came back later in the movie. So it is always possible that she comes back. It's hard to tell. We'll have to watch all the episodes before we find out. Just do not be surprised if she does show up at the end. The opening title sequence doesn't change. It's the exact same one from episode one. A lot of people not fans of the AI art that they use for this sequence. I explained what all the Easter eggs are during these different scenes in the opening titles, so you can watch my episode one video for that. 
then when the Russian military are looking for Nick Fury and all the train cars, they might be legit, or they could just be part of Gravik's group of scrolls. Talos, pretending to be a woman, literally says it's more likely that they'd find aliens when she, in fact, is an alien scroll herself. She is Talos. They have a long conversation talking about their backstories relative, like Nick Fury talks about his history as a child growing up, and then Talos talks about the backstory of the scrolls. A lot of exposition during this scene. Nick Fury's story was about riding trains from Alabama to Detroit and how racism affected their family. It's meant to be a parallel for the way the world views the scrolls in present day when he talks about coexistence being completely impossible. Like, we try to kill ourselves. Humans can't coexist. How do you imagine we try to coexist with scrolls? When he starts joking about his childhood hookups with Susie in Old Man Jackson's barn, that might be him just making an old man Samuel L. Jackson joke because in real life, he is in his 70s. He is an old man. But he uses the whole speech just to let Talos know he can tell when someone is lying to him, even if he can't tell immediately if someone's a scroll or not. Talos then talks a lot about the scroll's backstory and what really happened to their homeworld, Skrullos. The official story that they told Nick Fury back in the 90s is that the Kree defeated them on their home planet, but about a million of them were able to escape and scatter to the rest of the universe. Most of them stayed inside the Milky Way galaxy. That's Earth's galaxy. So this is what the map of the Marvel Universe looks like. Kree scroll space isn't that far from Earth space. What winds up happening, though, is that we get to Avengers Infinity War. Thanos snaps the Infinity Gauntlet, snaps half of the universe. Nick Fury is snapped, so he disappears. Talos says that he thought that he would never be coming back, and they depended on him to find them a place to live. And there were a bunch of scrolls, like half of the scrolls were still around. That's when Talos sent out a signal to all the survivors to come to planet Earth, because now there was a bunch more space to live on planet Earth with half of the people snapped. And during the five-year time jump, about a million Skrulls, pretty much everybody with a few exceptions that survived the destruction of Skrullos, their homeworld, had come to planet Earth and been living there when the Hulk comes in Avengers Endgame and snaps everyone back. So the Skrulls have been hiding on planet Earth for a while now. He says the only Skrulls that did not answer the call to come to planet Earth were the ones that lived in Emperor Droge's colony. Within the MCU, that's meant to be the Emperor of the Skrulls when their home planet was conquered, meaning that he also escaped, but a portion of them stayed with the Emperor in a separate colony on a different world somewhere else in the galaxy, so they're meant to be like a completely different group of Skrulls. I think the reason for mentioning them specifically is because they'll show up in a future movie at some point. It might have something to do with the Hulkling character, we'll see. They wouldn't include that detail if it were going to mean something in the future. In the comics, it was actually Emperor Doric who first decided to conquer Earth. He was in a battle with the Fantastic Four. He fought the Avengers. He also created the Super Scroll, which is a big part of this episode. Like the other big thing that happens in this episode, aside from finding out that Nick Fury has a wife, is learning that they are doing legit Super Scrolls. But he wound up dying before they could pull that off. Princess Faranki took command of the Scrolls and was the one who perpetrated Secret Invasion of the comics. Within the Young Avengers comics, Hulkling is the grandson of Emperor Doric, and in the present day of the comics, he becomes the new Skrull Emperor. We'll see if they wind up doing Hulkling at some point. We know they're going to do Young Avengers, and there'll be a big teaser for that during the Marvels movie, but I don't know everybody that's going to be on that roster. They've already introduced most of the characters that I think are going to be on that team, but we'll see if there are a couple others, like Hulkling, for instance. When they start arguing over the whole concept of the scrolls being able to coexist on planet Earth, I think that's meant to be foreshadowing for the future of the MCU. Like, eventually, some of the scrolls will win over the world governments, but it's going to take a long time. Like, we're talking after Secret Wars. You have to imagine Thunderbolt Ross is going to become president of the United States by the events of Captain America 4, and there is no way, no way he would let any scrolls live in the United States, let alone any other world nations. So the whole idea is that Secret Invasion is meant to be the beginning of Marvel's Dark Reign era, where things just continue to get worse and worse and worse for all the good characters. We see Maria Hill's casket. This is her mother. I don't think we'd ever heard anything about her family, or she hadn't referenced her mother, or any of the other characters that were really close to her outside of the other Avengers characters in previous Marvel movies. Separately, Gravik also reveals that Nick Fury secretly wants to die. Like, I'm not going to give him the thing that he wants, and it makes it sound like he really wants to die. They have the Scroll High Council meeting. Remember, Gravik took Talos's place on the council, so Talos used to be meeting with these different people. And the whole idea is they have this news broadcast where you see a bunch of world leaders and news anchors. Those are all the people that are in this council meeting. It's just meant to show you that many of the world leaders of the most powerful nations are scrolls in disguise. They've already kind of secretly taken over the world. 
This is the head of NATO. We have Shooter McGavin, who's playing a Fox News type of anchor, like a J. Jonah Jameson type of character. Within the series, his name is meant to be Chris Stearns. This is the British Prime Minister. I'm not sure who Shirley is meant to represent. And they don't say who this other person is, just another head of some other nation. And the whole idea here is that it's basically Gravik taking control of the council and turning them to his will towards full-blown secret invasion, like, we need to start now. Take the planet. The council says they're worried about the Avengers returning and stopping them. When Gravik says he's already got a plan to deal with the Avengers, that's a reference to both comic book Secret Invasion, where the Skrulls impersonated the Avengers, the X-Men, pretty much all the big groups of Marvel heroes. But it's also a reference to his Super Scroll plan to give them superpowers. Like they'd be able to also fight the Avengers to a standstill, the more powerful Avengers. They vote Gravik the role of Skrull General. Now, he's not Skrull Emperor. He is the general of this council. Remember, this is meant to be a completely separate group of Skrulls that rule by council. If the Skrull Emperor lived on the planet, then he would have final say. When Shirley becomes the lone dissenter and says that they ended up in this situation because of their aggressive warlike ways in the past, that's a reference to the kree Skrull War. Like, because we couldn't find peace with the Kree, that's why we wound up in this situation. And it's meant to be a parallel for what will happen in present day. Like, if we continue to try and invade the Earth, a full-scale invasion, it will only end up in the destruction of our race. A lot of people wondering about what Gravik whispered to his minion here, because Amelia Clark's character is listening in, maybe to kill the Shirley character. There's a lot of plans that he's trying to hide from Gaia's character, because like I said, I think that he suspects her. And they also want to establish during these scenes that Gaia is turning against him slowly and will eventually help Nick Fury and Talos more. Part of that is because Gravik literally killed her mother. They start talking about the next phase, which is a reference to Marvel phases, but also the next phase of their secret invasion, harvesting different DNA, the DNA of all these different superpowered individuals and beings that they've captured, which are all the different powers that they're going to give themselves as Super Scrolls. In the comics, the Super Scroll was a single character, and it was mostly a Fantastic Four-based character who had all of the Fantastic Four's powers. So the whole idea is they had an amalgam of a bunch of different powers. There are also a couple scenes later in the trailer where you see Amelia Clark's character bathed in energy, so I think the idea is that she's also going to become one of the Super Scrolls in addition to Gravik some of the others. Then Rhodey comes to London for a World Security Council meeting on behalf of the United States President. Rhodey, playing the politician, makes some jokes about putting on his war machine suit, his armor, going out to the delegate from Slovakia. You notice the British Prime Minister, who we now know as a scroll, is wearing a green necklace, sort of calling it out, probably because of their recent council decision to go ahead with a full-scale takeover Earth. So she's hiding less, being more brazen, like, we're going to take over this planet any day now. He meets with Nick Fury to talk about secret invasion. His joke about the Brioni suit being the cheaper of the two suits is because his war machine armor suit and Iron Man's armors all cost billions of dollars each. That's how rich Iron Man is, they could blow up all his armors during Iron Man 3 like it's no big deal. What's $100 billion? Who cares? They'll get into that during the Armor Wars series with the real version of Rhodey, because I think a lot of us suspect that this version of Rhodey is a scroll, and that's why during their meeting, he seems like he's pushing Nick Fury around so much and not willing to help him out, because he's secretly trying to help Gravik pull off Secret Invasion. They make a whole bunch of references during their conversation, too. Nick Fury saying that he has a higher rank than Rhodey, who's a colonel, is that Nick Fury's technically had a higher rank as director of S.H.I.E.L.D., even though they fire him during this conversation. Technically, it's the U.S. president that's firing him. If you didn't know before this, the government had been funding S.H.I.E.L.D., so technically the U.S. president was still Nick Fury's boss. The whole idea with Saber is that I think that he'd been running that in the absence of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, Saber was meant to be the next evolution of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the MCU, even though in the comics is actually S.W.O.R.D., but they kind of burned that during the WandaVision series. They make a Hydra reference. There are still some Hydra people active in the MCU, like Val is supposed to have ties to Hydra in the Serpent Society, who also has ties to Hydra in the Captain America 4 movie. I think the idea, though, is that Val used to be core Hydra and was just able to stay off the radar when Hydra and S.H.I.E.L.D. collapsed during the Winter Soldier movie. Rhodey claims that he's known about the scrolls for the past 15 years, and if you look at the dates, that puts it around 2008 when the first Iron Man movie happened, so it sounds like it was right after the first Iron Man movie when he learned about the scrolls for the first time. When he suggests they call their quote-unquote friends, he's talking about the Avengers. The reason Nick Fury says, not yet, don't jump the gun, is because he also thinks that that's what Gravik wants. Like, if we call them in, they start a big war, they start duplicating them, and turn the Avengers into terrorists, which is basically him describing the comic book Secret Invasion plot. That's basically what happened in the comics. 
Rhodey gets all political on him. If you remember, Rhodey is now the right-hand man to the U.S. president, so he is very literally a politician. And I think part of the idea is that he's been a deep cover scroll that they haven't been able to detect because the longer they hold their human form, the harder it is to detect them, and he's just been doing it for a long time now. And he's using his access to the president to help further this secret invasion. A lot of people are now wondering what happened to the real Rhodey and when did it become Scroll Rhodey? Like, when did they make the switch? My guess is it'll have something to do with Captain America's Civil War. Like, it won't be all this time in the MCU. Like, he was real Rhodey during the first Iron Man movie, probably the second Iron Man movie. But I think sometime around Captain America's Civil War is when they'll say Scroll Rhodey took his place. Just seems awfully sus. They reference Alexander Pierce from the Winter Soldier movie, who was Hydra and one of the directors of the World Security Council. And a lot of this conversation is just meant to show you that Nick Fury will literally have to do this on his own for the most part, with Talos' help, of course. But it's Rhodey trying to cut him off of the past, like cut him off from any resources that he might get from the government. Sonya Fallsworth then tortures one of Gravik's men that they've captured from the Russian square for more information, goes full Val on him, proving that he is a scroll. party time it is. It almost looks like she kind of enjoys that too, like, oh, hey, a party, great, let's go. Then Gaia learns about the Super Scroll plan, all the different DNA from powered beings like Groot, Frost Beast, which is from the Thor movies, Cole Obsidian from Avengers Infinity War, Extremis from Iron Man 3, and probably some more superheroes and other powerful characters in there too. We don't see the complete list, like they just show you the computer screen for a little while, so there are probably other characters on there that they've stolen DNA from. They probably got some of the samples of the Frost Beast before the events of Thor Ragnarok when the planets aligned during Thor The Dark World. The samples of Groot's DNA would have been left after the final battle in Avengers Endgame in upstate New York, just pieces of his body that broke off during the battle. Cool Obsidian's hand was severed by Wong during Avengers Infinity War. The Extremis is from Iron Man 3. They'd still have that research. And even though there is a lot of Fantastic Four Easter eggs with all this Super Scroll plot, I'm not expecting to see any of the Fantastic Four characters during this, even though Marvel just canceled their Comic-Con plans because of what's happening with the strike. I think they were actually going to announce who the new Fantastic Four cast was going to be at their Comic-Con panel. Maybe they'll do that sometime outside of Comic-Con, but hopefully we'll find out pretty soon. There are a couple of the classic Fantastic Four actors, maybe even Chris Evans coming back as a version of Human Torch during Deadpool 3. But that's sort of like a separate thing, maybe Secret Wars too, because it's a big multiverse movie. Originally, the Super Scroll was meant to be one character, and his name was Kaler. Citizens of planet Earth, I am Super Scroll. Emissary of the Imperial Skrull Expeditionary Forces, I have been appointed by Emperor Amok to be your new leader. He started out as a normal Skrull soldier in their army, decorated for his bravery, his combat ability, he won all these accolades, then fell into disgrace, got banished. Then to tie things more to Secret Invasion, the original idea for the Skrulls to pull off Secret Invasion came from Emperor Doric, who was the Emperor before Princess Faranki, the person who actually pulled it off, came along. Bringing it back around to the Fantastic Four, because Super Skrull came from the Fantastic Four comics, basically. Originally, Emperor Doric is the one who tried to invade Earth in the Fantastic Four comics. It was way back in Fantastic Four number 2 in 1961, like that's how far back it goes. The Fantastic Four wind up stopping the invasion, and then he basically takes all their powers and grafts them onto Kalert, making him a scroll that has actual special powers, whereas most of the scrolls at the time only had the ability to change form and just had basic super strength as part of their biology. Their bodies are a little bit stronger, more resilient than human bodies in the way that all regular Asgardians who don't have special powers just have stronger bodies and live longer. Same thing with Loki's character. Now, like, Loki and Thor are different because they do have actual special powers. Like, Loki practices magic. Thor has actual celestial god powers. They're just changing this a little bit in the MCU version, giving all these newer scrolls, like the younger generation, special powers, more evolved bodies. After Gravik stops her from finding more information, they go to rescue the scroll that Sonya Fallsworth captured, and then killing him outside of their settlement is just meant to show you how hardcore they are. Like, okay, you gave up information, so we're going to kill you off right now. Then probably the other major reveal of the episode, Nick Fury travels to his secret home. They confirm he has a wife, and she is a scroll. Now, he'd referenced in the past that he had a house as a private citizen, but he didn't talk about a wife ever. I don't think he's ever referenced having a family himself. Some of the Avengers characters probably knew about his wife. Like, Black Widow, Hawkeye probably figured it out. Like, that's Black Widow's whole thing is information. But not all the Avengers. And that's why they have that ritual about him putting his wedding ring back on. Because had he worn the wedding ring around this whole time, everybody and their sister would have learned that he had a family. She'll be a bigger character in future episodes. Like, she shows up in the trailer a couple different places. 
There are a couple big storylines. The big thing right now is just what's going on with his wife. Like, how is she going to become a big part of this? And the Super Scroll plot. Like, how are they going to further that? Because there are a couple other big trailer shots of them stealing other DNA parts. Graphics group stealing parts like Cole Obsidian's hand. Because there are a couple scenes from previous trailers where you see them trying to steal those pieces of DNA. Like, I think this is now confirmed to be Cole Obsidian's severed hand. Let me know in the comments, when do you think that they're actually going to start turning them into Super Scrolls? Do you think they'll save that for the final episode or like the final two episodes? After episode one, there were a lot of people that also theorized that Gravik had some special relationship with Nefuri. Like there was something between them that they hadn't revealed yet. Some people even thought that he might be Nick Fury's secret son. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what they're trying to say here. But I do think they want to show that Gravik trusted Nick Fury and he became kind of like a surrogate father to him. And that's why Nick Fury recently taking off on the space station, just being gone for that five year time jump because he'd been blipped, feels like a betrayal to Gravik and what drove him over the edge to actually execute this secret invasion. So I do think that there's like this really personal relationship between Graphic and Nick Fury that they haven't fully revealed yet, but they'll probably get a couple really big scenes together in the next couple of episodes. Also, let me know in the comments, which other big Marvel superpowered characters or superpowered individuals do you think that they're trying to steal powers from to give themselves more Super Scroll powers? I don't think they'd be able to do it, but it would be really handy if they could somehow get Scarlet Witch's DNA to give themselves some chaos magic powers. It doesn't necessarily work like that, but if you're grabbing people's powers, you want to grab the most powerful character's powers. My Secret Invasion Episode 3 trailer video will post tomorrow, and my full Episode 3 video will post next week after they release it. There's a couple of the really big things going on this week too, so make sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss any of those. Click here for that Episode 3 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. And click here to learn about Ben Affleck coming back as his version of Daredevil in Deadpool 3. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.